going to let this play for just a couple more seconds. Go ahead. Keep it up. Keep it up if you have it. Ah, there we go. Yeah, we like good music. Uh, my next guest needs no introduction to a lot of you, but with the career in music that he's had, he certainly deserves one. He is a native of Windsor, Connecticut. He's been named one of the top 100 guitarists of the 20th century. He spent over two decades with a band called the uh, New Rhythm and Blues Quartet. You might know it as NRBQ, and he's had a prolific songwriting career as well. I'm happy to have Big Al Anderson on the show, uh, making Connecticut proud. All the, drove all the way up from New Mexico to play I flew. this weekend. Oh, you flew? Oh, I flew. Well, that's Believe way me. better than driving up. Good to meet you, sir. Same a pleasure here. to have you here on the show. Thanks for having me. And, I, you know, it's, it's been a while since uh, you, certainly you've been touring a long time, but now you've agreed to play some shows this weekend at the Kate down in Old Saybrook, the Catherine Hepburn uh, Performing Arts Center. Uh, what motivated you to do that, sir? Well, it was, I don't know. It's a good question. but <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to come back and play for the, my home state. Yeah. yeah. And uh, those are the places. You can sit down in these places, the infinity here in Hartford and not yes. in Norfolk. And yeah. They're so, they're small. They're intimate. There's yeah, something they're, about they're, that's like my that. tour. Yeah, and that, has that always been uh, sort of your style? I mean, I imagine you've played all sorts of places, big and small, especially with your years at NRBQ and even starting, you know, playing sock hops with the uh, the Wild Weeds. Uh, what is your preferred venue, I guess, for playing music when you do play? Uh, a crummy dive. Crummy dive. Yeah, that's where you're usually <laughs> the best. I don't know why, but. <laughs> There's something to be said for that. Now, that song you were hearing, No Good to Cry, that was a, a, a regional hit, that, one you wrote. Uh, when did you write that song? What, what 65, year was it? 65, I think, 60, early 66. Yeah. And we were, we had a, we were just a, a high school band mm -hmm. in, uh, in Windsor High School. And then we met this guy, Ray Ziner, who had gigs down in the north end of Hartford in, uh, at uh, the Rockabye. Yeah. It's the best one. It was a black dive. Yeah. And I hadn't even started singing it, but when I I play a solo and black people went nuts over it, I was, that, that, to me that was a pivotal change in my life. They just found uh, out about Ray Charles. And, I can imagine that must have been fantastic. Did Did you expect the song to sort of take off? At, you know. No, it sat in the can for a long time. We did it by ourselves. Yeah. And then this guy Doc Cavalier got it to. Chess, and we ended up being on Chess Records, which is a black label. Yep. And uh, you know what? I, I heard some covers. I, I never knew you wrote the song. Heard the Allman Brothers yep. playing that song, too. Did they ever give you credit for doing that? No, they, not on the record. It says uh, right or unknown because they, they thought it was Ain't No Good to Cry, and they couldn't find the... <laughs> Oh, okay. So they weren't just being jerks. Yeah. You're, I noticed that. Yeah, they added the ink to the title. The real title is just no good to cry. And ZZ Top, I wrote a song with Billy Gibbons a couple of years ago, and he told me that he heard it on the Wolfman Jack show, and and he had a radio station in <laughs> Mexico. Yeah. So he didn't have to mess with the FCC. He just played whatever he wanted to. That is fantastic. And I imagine we could spend half an hour just talking about your years with, with NRBQ. Uh, boy, they just seem to not only love music, they seem to love playing. They, it, I, you know, I can't speak to them that they necessarily took themselves more or less seriously than other musicians. But there seemed to be an ethos about just having fun, freewheeling set lists. Things were a lot less structured in a very good way. We took ourselves seriously having fun. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I, I guess. Yeah. What was that experience like? It was great. I learned so much about music. Mm -hmm. Like I, I didn't know what I was doing when I first got in there. I just I learned a lot of stuff. How did you wind up getting hooked up with NRBQ? Uh, we went up to play with them. Somebody arranged for the while we used to go up and play there, and I, I didn't know it was an audition. <laughs> really? I played with them up in upstate New York somewhere, and uh, so, I got the gig. Well, you must have been doing something right if they, they were, were coming out to audition. I idolized the band in the first place. Yeah. The first two albums. Yeah. And, and the then, guitar player is just amazing. And uh, you were with them uh, from this, uh, about uh, 1970, I think, one or so, straight through the 1990s. And then you decided you had had enough, and you moved to another phase of your career, which is uh, less visible but no less impressive, writing country music uh, hits for, I mean, just a, a veritable who's who in country music. Has that always been in your blood? Because with the Wild Weeds and NRBQ, I wouldn't think country first. My mom would let me go to the, sleep with the radio on, and uh, at nighttime you could get AM stations from all over the country. Yeah. And I found WWVA in Wheeling, West Virginia. 
<laughs> and I became, and that's how I found out about country music. What was it about country music that just sort of got into your? Blood? I don't know the look of a guitar. I just fell in love with the look of a guitar, and it's easier music. Yeah. Uh, it, uh, what, what do you mean by easier? Three chords. Okay. All right. <laughs> so, but it's pretty. It's got a little more soul than like '80s music with the then, power chords. And then uh, rock and roll and. Country music became pretty much the same thing. The Everly Brothers and Elvis and everybody all came from the South, mm -hmm. mostly. And uh, Jerry Lee. I, I've always wanted to know what the songwriting process is like because when you hear different musicians, especially accomplished ones, sometimes some of them are coming up with a basic idea. Some of them, all of a sudden, the riff or the, the hook just hits them. Yep, How all, does it work for you? All of the above. Really? And we, we either do a two way or a three way, we can get into a room and Somebody will have an idea, like you see sometimes they don't have an idea, or they'll play a little guitar lick, and what was that? And yeah. So in that way, is it a collaborative effort? Yes, a lot? oh yeah. Does that work for you, though, writing country music for other people, necessarily, you're going to play it? I mean, Playing you, it. I wrote, oh, I didn't just write country music down, oh, down there. Right? Yeah. Bonnie Raitt and... You, you were writing all sorts Harry of Harry Connick Jr. and Eddie James and Bonnie Raitt and... The Carpenters, posthumously. <laughs> That's amazing. You just rattle them off like that. Yeah. Would, just any one of those would be a career for most people. Uh, but no, not for Big Al. Certainly making um, Connecticut proud. We're so glad to have you. One last question. I just wanted to ask you about the recording process, too. Uh, it's not probably like lay people like me think where er the band is always necessarily together. Is it sort of more of a fractured process sometimes where you have to do things in isolation or by yourself? In Nashville? Uh, pretty much anywhere, I get them. I, I wouldn't even know. Pretty much always there. Okay. Yeah, and then, and then uh, in Nashville, they come in, all the players, they get their stuff. You, you, you play them a little tape. Yeah. And they can go out and play the song. And that was that. That's but, all I it mean, takes? it's just it's just amazing. And some of the players that got, <laughs> and I stay about for ten years trying to get the guitar parts right. <laughs> Oh, oh I'm, sl I'm slower than they are. <laughs> Somehow I have trouble believing that. You're being modest. But uh, uh, before you go, tell me again about the shows Saturday and Sunday. Who are you playing with? What are you going to play? It's, we're playing with the floor models with Jim Chaptelaine and Paul Chikansky and Lauren Inches. Mm -hmm. And we're playing a lot of the old stuff, some new stuff that we haven't done ever. Yeah. And I do a little acoustic set. So everything, a little bit of everything. Well, and there you go. And I've seen some shows at the Cade. It's a wonderful little venue uh, to watch local music, especially when it's coming from a Connecticut legend. Like I said, doing Connecticut proud. Windsor Zone, Big Al, good to see you. Thanks so much. A pleasure to have you here on the show. Bye. Take care, everybody.